ladies and gentlemen, welcome to TMRP, the Metropolis Radio Podcast. And on my first SSX stream, I said that I was making a different argument than this, but I decided to scrap it. And I decided to scrap my original argument. The original argument was uh, of um, why we need gatekeepers in entertainment. And I scrapped that because I realized that it was a dumb argument to make. But it also got me thinking that the people that are pushing this idea in the movie sphere of the internet are the fandom menace. And some of these guys have been around for a while. And what I wanted to go into is basically how the fandom menace as a movement has always been fundamentally flawed. It's always something that has, you know, been at the back of my mind. And now this doesn't mean that I'm against their convictions, far from it. Um, our opinions tend to overlap a lot. Uh, I just believe that their goals are vastly unobtainable. So uh, let's get right into that. Now, first off, we need to look at, you know, the Phantom Menace origins. Where exactly did they come from? Because this was a movement that wasn't just formed overnight and then just became a thing. And I would argue it actually traces back about over the last 10 years with the invasion of all these um, actors in bad faith that have been coming into all of these, you know, creative, these creative positions in Hollywood along with executive positions. And we saw this with Kathy Kennedy coming in with, uh, with Lucasfilm. And the second that Disney bought them out, she was instantly pushing, you know, the whole, the force is female. And, you know, you have, you know, Ray quote unquote Skywalker, her brainchild of a character. Here's a, here's a great idea for a female character. Have a female character that is not allowed to show any feminine traits. That was all Kathy Kennedy. I can't exactly blame J.J. Abrams for that because he's more of like your corporate kind of guy, your corporate filmmaker, you know. He's going to do whatever the fuck the studio wants to do and not really put up much of a fight. And speaking of Abrams, you know, especially when Abrams did, did Star Trek, here's how he's an actor in bad faith. Um... It actually started right around the time of Star Trek Into Darkness. I do remember. I do remember this, that um, there the um the media at the time, because the 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 concern was was uh, Benedict Cumberbatch's character John Harrison, uh was ju was basically just con in disguise, and both Cumberbatch and J J Abrams are coming out assuring, oh no no no, John Harrison is a completely brand new character. He's not con, but we we all know we all know what happened. My name is Kai. And um, so what happened after that is I think it was Marina Sirtis actually called out J.J. Abrams uh, for his Star Trek movies. And he blatantly came out and said, well, you know, I wasn't the biggest fan of the original Star Trek to begin with. So eh, whatever. And I'm, and I'm literally sitting back just thinking, why the fuck is J.J. Abrams making Star Trek when he now just admitted that he never was a fan of Star Trek to begin with. Of course these movies were a goddamn dumpster fire. And the sad part is, the, the Star Trek 2009, his first movie, actually wasn't half bad. It didn't turn into dog shit until he tried to basically remake The Wrath of Khan, and, you know, that's where he earned the, uh, the proud nickname of the franchise killer. He killed Star Trek in two movies. He killed Star Wars in two movies. He killed Lost with that bullshit ending. So I have no idea how he's still around. And this, and, and, and guys, before, you know, with, with regards to the Phantom Menace, this is a lot more than just movies and TV. Uh, this was also going into gaming and into comics at the time. You had people like Anita Sarkeesian pulling this bullshit. Everything is sexist, everything is racist, everything is homophobic, and you have to point it all out. And then, um, to, and then to continue on into gaming, you then had uh, Patrick Sutherland, and I don't remember, was he the CTO or the CFO of, uh, of Electronic Arts a few years ago? I don't remember which one, but he was a pretty high level executive. And um, this was back when, uh, back when uh, Battlefield V was originally coming out. And you had like the bionic arm woman, you know, coming and beating the shit out of the guy with the cricket bat. And everyone was criticizing that where it's like, yeah, that's not exactly the most, you know, realistic, you know, because I don't think that many people during World War II exactly had prosthetic limbs. 
and you know and you know women also didn't typically fight on the front lines back then some did but the vast majority didn't and patrick sutherland before battlefield 5 released proudly came out and said well if you don't like it then don't buy it and guess what everyone decided to do just not buy the game and you wonder why, you know, Battlefield 5 is the lowest selling entry in the franchise. And not only that, you wonder why we haven't yet gotten another Battlefield game in, in the in the series. And, and if I'm not mistaken, I think EA killed all support for for Battlefield 5 just I think it was I think it was a couple years ago. When when did Battlefield 5 come out? Was that 2018? It was either 2018 or 2019. I don't remember. I'm gonna go look it up real quick. Um da 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 da. And sorry guys, I'm not doing a screen recording of this. Whoops, I went to the wrong site. As I typically do. Okay, Battlefield 5. Uh, Battlefield 5, that was November of 2018, I was right. Yeah, they killed all support of that by like the end of 2019, beginning of 2020, because the sales numbers just were not there. And I did bring up, and, and I can I can go on about gaming. I can bring up Manveer Air, who was, um, who was the uh, who was the creative director behind uh, behind Mass Effect Andromeda? But that's a whole separate you know that's a whole separate discussion. I think I made my point in gaming, but I also bring up comics and the one thing and the one person that I fucking think of in comics that perfectly sums up the problem that the comics industry has been going through for the last 10, 15 years is Kelly Sue DeConnick with this legendary interview from Sci-Fi Wire. And if you don't like my politics, don't buy my book. Problem solved. Now, to not kick a horse while you know, to not kick someone while they're while they're down, I'm gonna I'm gonna move on from this. And what I was gonna move on with was that uh, Sir Isaac Newton came up with the with the laws of physics. And basically, you know, Sir Isaac Newton's laws of physics say that every action has an equal or opposite reaction. So what I would argue is that the invasion of all of these bad faith actors and entertainment, no matter what it was, no matter if it was movies, television shows, gaming, comics, whatever, you know, uh, the Phantom Menace was a, was a purely natural reaction to these extreme changes over the last 10 years. Again, every action has an equal or opposite reaction if you look at it in the world, in the world of physics. So yeah, essentially the movement started off as a natural reaction, but they really didn't gain traction until 2017, 2018. And I would argue that they really didn't gain much traction until one little movie came out in a beloved franchise. And that was The Last Jedi. Basically to sum up The, La to, to sum up the Last Jedi, um, they, Ryan Johnson completely undid all of the quote unquote mystery boxes of The Force Awakens. Who are Rey's parents? Your Snoke theory sucks. Oh, you want to see Luke Skywalker on the big screen? Oh yeah, he's a coward that's going to run and hide now. And I would argue with all these mystery boxes of The Force Awakens, my argument at the time, and still is, is who the fuck cares? None of these characters were that great to begin with, even in The Force Awakens. And The Force Awakens heavily relied upon its sequels in order for the movie to work. So Ryan Johnson did not start the problem, but he sure as fuck did not help it. And basically The Last Jedi was avant-garde for the sake of avant-garde. Now for those that don't know what that means, that's basically, I'm gonna come in and change something up just to change something up. Despite the fact that I'm working within a well-established franchise, that has a clear set of expectations going into it. No, I'm just gonna change it just, ju just to change it because what the fuck ever, because my name is Ryan Johnson, my name is JJ Abrams, whoever. And then what was, what was their response for, you know, to all the fans that didn't like The Last Jedi? Uh, basically started attacking them in the, in the press and on Twitter. I think Ryan Johnson even going as far as to even calling them a bunch of man babies. And, and then declaring that it's only the quote unquote alt-right trolls that hated The Last Jedi. And this is where you get the, the absolute dumbest fucking thing to ever come out of a creator or an executive directly to the audience. It's not our fault that you don't like the movie. It's your fault is basically all it turned into. 
but I would argue it, that it's not just the Last Jedi. The Last Jedi, sure, was the spark was the spark to the war. It's like it's like World War One. The assassination of Archduke Franz Ferdinand was not the what was the thing that sparked the war but the seeds were planted long before that and i argue it with with the rise of the phantom menace i would argue going back as far as you know 2014 uh when lucasfilm openly declared that the original expanded universe all of the the video games all of the books when, when george ran the company oh those those are no longer canon and they rebranded them as, as legends so right then and there, you just pissed off a good portion of your fan base that's in the long tail. And for those that don't know what the long tail is, think of a franchise as a, a very, very large funnel, right? Those are the movies, okay? You have a funnel that is designed to catch a lot of people all at once. Now, all of those people are not going to trickle down. So what the long tail is, it's that funnel that's that's being extended, right? Not everyone is going to be trickling down. Some people are just going to watch the movies, and that's it. That's all their involvement is. But the long tail would be, you know, the comic books based on Star Wars, uh, the the novel, the um, not just the movie novelizations, but even novels like um, uh, like the the Bounty Hunter Wars, which was basically the Boba Fett trilogy, the Thrawn trilogy. That's all in the long tail. The video games, that's all in the long tail. The TV shows, all in the long tail. So they're coming out straight up and saying, oh yeah, this, this expanded universe that you that you guys have loved since, since it started back in the late 80s, early 90s, yeah, that's no longer canon now. We're gonna do, we're gonna do our own things now and, um, and they're gonna really fucking suck. And this wasn't just Lucasfilm you know, Star Wars, a lot of people were doing this. I think 2016, just before the release of, um, of, um, uh, Star Trek Beyond. Sorry, it took me a minute to, to think about that. Um, there was a little fan, there was a little fan film called, uh, Star Trek Axanar. Now, before I go any further, I don't give a shit what your opinion is on Alec Peters. I'm just bringing this up because it is, a, it is a, because I am trying to make this point that, Paramount decided to come out with the fan film guidelines. Now, there's some of them where, where they do make sense where, you know, you can't pass this off as official Star Trek. You have to make it very clear that it is a fan production. But most of the fan film guidelines basically were saying, oh, you can make fan films as long as they fucking suck. You know, as long as, you know, the, the effects don't rival what, what we're doing despite the fact that at-home technology is catching up and is actually getting, in, in, and in some cases, getting better than what you can see, you know, then, then, you know, not getting better than what you can see, but, you know, you can match our quality to a degree on the screen, but, you know, you, you better not make a good fan film there, sir. No, 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 no. And then what did, and then what did we get as, as a result? What was the, what was the next greatest Star Trek? was um, Star Trek Discovery and the creation of the ultimate Mary Sue, Michael fucking Burnham. Now, some will argue that she's not a Mary Sue because, oh, well, Mar well, because Michael Burnham has flaws and, you know, Mary Sues are supposed to be absolutely flawless. Not entirely true. Because if you watch Star Trek Discovery, notice they cannot, like, openly disparage Michael Burnham at all. You know, they can, you know, you can have one person criticize her, but then like two seconds later, we'll say she is the best officer I have ever worked with, but they could criticize her for starting the damn war with the Klingons, but she is the best officer that I have ever worked with. If you can't disparage the female character, that is still a Mary Sue. You can't speak ill toward them. And then the final point I want to bring up on this is, you know, if uh, another little franchise has been going on for a lot longer than um, than Star Trek has was Doctor Who, and they basically just gender swap the Doctor just to gender swap the Doctor again, change for the sake of change. You know, it's it's never a good idea because it's always going to go over like a lead balloon. 
and apparently that has led to nothing but disaster. Personally, I refuse to watch Doctor Who after they replaced Matt Smith with Peter, with Peter Capaldi. Not that I hated Peter Capaldi, but I think that the show has been on a downward trend for a good number of years, long before they gender swapped the Doctor with uh, with uh, Jodie Whittaker. Now that we've gotten all the back all the all the backstory out of the way, now let's examine their flawed arguments. And basically, I want to start with basically what is the reason for their existence. They, you know, according to themselves. Uh, they exist because they want to save these franchises from the quote-unquote woke mafia. But here's the here's the fundamental flaw with that argument. The one X factor that these people are never taking into consideration is the people who work on these franchises today, not the people who worked on 20, 30 years ago. Uh, the people who work on these franchises today feel that it is their moral duty to put their woke politics in everything that they do. So, to put it bluntly, if somebody feels like that it is, it is my moral duty, my moral obligation to be this political, they're never going to stop, no, ma no matter what you do. You could threaten to boycott all you want. They, you know, the studios could lose hundreds of millions of dollars. You could see the absolute bankruptcy of the Walt Disney Company. It's not going to stop their actions. You know, I, I hate to be you know, this much of a quote-unquote black pillar, but that's just the reality of the situation. And with regard to Star Wars, I hate to break it to all of you Phantom Menace channels, but Star Wars died the moment George Lucas sold it to Disney. October 30th, 2012, as soon as he signed that dotted line, that's it. Star Wars was officially dead. All Disney can do now is basically make legal fan fiction. That really is it. You know, one, once George Lucas walked away from it, it is no, it, there is no more official Star Wars. George no longer has control over Star Wars, therefore, Star Wars isn't worth saving. And let's expand on this. No one who worked on the original Star Trek shows are creating Star Trek anymore. That would be Gene Roddenberry, Rick Berman, Alan Dean Foster, Nicholas Meyer, Jonathan Frakes, and there's probably a lot more names I can't think of off the top of my head right now. Therefore, Star Trek isn't worth saving. No one who worked on the initial run of Doctor Who is working on it to this day. And I really hate to say this. You know, I hate to say this as someone who loved the Russell T. Davies era of Doctor Who. But Doctor Who, the Ru and specifically the Russell T. Davies era of Doctor Who, that was, you know, Christopher Eccleston and David Tennant. The Chris Reckleston, David Tennant years was basically legal fan fiction. Therefore, Doctor Who is not worth saving. And I would even go as far as to say that none of these channels really are good critics. Their criticisms are so vague that they can really be applied to any movie, TV show, book, play, etc. that has ever existed in the history of mankind. And it usually comes down to, you know, oh, it was too dark. But they never go into what defines too dark for them. Um, Mary Sue is even another one. That has been misapplied to a bunch of characters that are not Mary Sue's, but they want them to be Mary Sue's. And a perfect example of that was Mariner from, um, from Star Trek Lower Decks. But that's neither here nor there. And the, and the big one, doesn't fit within canon. You know, I, I hate to break it to you, but Star Trek has been going now since 1966. At some point over the last 55 years as of the uploading of this, yeah, it's pretty hard to keep all of that continuity straight from the original series up through Enterprise, including the original 10 movies... You know, good, good luck keeping all that shit straight in your head, okay? At some point, you know, and especially given that these are TV shows, too. I think Star Trek The Next Generation ran for 170 episodes. At some point, you're going to contradict yourself, it, it, whether intentional or not. And a lot of times it's unintentional. But if you've been going for that long, yeah, good luck not contradicting yourself. Um... The original Star Wars, you know, especially the original Expanded Universe. The, the, and I'm talking, the, the original Expanded Universe that everybody seemed to love. The original Expanded Universe contradicted itself all the damn time. 
Hell, even Doctor Who. Doctor Who has been running longer than Star Trek and Star Wars. I think it's been running ever since the 1950s. You know, like late 1950s, early 1960s. So yeah, good luck trying to keep, good luck trying to keep up with all of that, all of that continuity. It just it can't be done, whether these people want to admit it or not. You you know, at some point you will you will contradict yourself, even if you don't want to. It doesn't matter. It's not a matter of if you contradict yourself in a 40 or 50 plus year old franchise. It's all a matter of when. Now let's discuss their inevitable fall because if we're being 100% honest. Um, they are not going to remain this popular for, you know, really much longer. Their, their, down, their downfall is inevitable. And I'm not the first person to make this argument, so I'm not taking any, any credit for the following claims. The problem with the fandom menace as a movement as a whole is twofold. The first is, the first, the first is outrage marketing only works for so long. At some point, you're gonna have to do something different or else everyone who is watching you right now is just simply going to move on. And I'm not, I'm not saying don't do outrage marketing because you know, I've, I've actively engaged, I've engaged in it. So it would be very hypocritical for me to point the finger, you know, shame, 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 shame. I'll shame you for doing it, but then I'm gonna continue to engage in it. No, I'm not saying don't do it, but some of these channels have made the outrage marketing the mean potatoes of their content. And you could very easily make the argument that the majority of their subscribers are just there for the outrage and not for the creator. And that is their inevitable fall, is they're not there because they like, because they like Jeremy from Geeks and Gamers. They're not there because they like Mecha Random 42. No, they're there because they like the drama. They like all the behind the scenes, you know, all the behind the scenes bullshit. All of the, you know, doomcock rumors type, type bullshit. Once those dry up and go away, that's it. Everyone who originally supported you will eventually move on because that's all you do is do a bunch of bullshit rumors, bunch of bullshit e-drama. At some point, it's going to come back to bite you in the ass. And here's the second point, and, and, a, and a lot of people are not bringing this up. A couple of people are. Uh, but, this, but, the, but I said that the problem with the Phantom Menace is twofold. Here's the, sec here's the second point. And I'm going to go as far as to make this argument. It is no longer in the Phantom Menace's best interest for these franchises to course correct. Yes, you heard me right. It is no longer in their best interest for Star Wars to return to form, for Star Trek to return to form, for Doctor Who to return to form. They're getting way too many views on the whole Mouse War sucks. Kathy Kennedy needs to be fired. Star Trek sucks. Uh, Alex Kurtzman, you know, needs to be shown the door. Blah, 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 blah. If all of these franchises were to course correct tomorrow, bye-bye Fandom Menace, no reason for you to exist, and you know, and you know, I'm only saying this because I saw the exact same thing with all of these Gamergate channels that popped up in like 2013, 2014. Once the controversy disappeared, once it died, so did a lot of those channels. And some of those were pretty big guys in the movement. Um, and to end this section off, um, Mr. Medicare once said that the average YouTube career only lasts about five years because at some point everyone moves on. You know, there are exceptions, obviously. And those people are still around largely because they make different content than what was once their meat and potatoes. They maybe started in outrage marketing, but they pivoted. And I'm gonna get more into that in just a second. With regards to, the, to their inevitable fall, I do feel that some of these channels will survive the onslaught. Like a lot, like there are some Gamergate channels that are still around to this day. Um, I think uh, Sargon of Akkad started off as, as a Gamergate channel, and you know, he's still around. Uh, but some of these channels I do feel will survive the onslaught because they've either already pivoted or they can easily pivot once the shit hits the fan. But channels like, like you know, I'll, I'll just use the biggest guy in the quote unquote Phantom Menace movement, uh, the geeks and gamers. I don't feel, I, I feel will not survive the onslaught. Mecha Random 42 will not survive the onslaught. Nerdrotic will not survive. Doomcock will not survive. Why? Because all these channels are, are basically TMZ light. That, that's all they are. And 
every time that they try to pivot into something new, it doesn't work out for them because they try to pivot way too late. Instead of pivoting maybe a couple years ago where, okay, I'll still continue to do the outrage marketing, but hey, look at all this other shit that I'm producing. No, they went 100% in on Last Jedi Sucks, then they went 100% in on, you know, Brie, on the Brie Larson shit. And then, you know, and then all, 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 all I'm going to say, and then all I'm going to say is this. All they need to have happen to them to lose the argument is an entry in one of these franchises, Star Wars, Star Trek, Doctor Who, you name it, to come out and have a majority of people go, eh, it's okay. And I argue this is what happened with Star Trek Lower Decks. A lot of these people, I remember seeing videos from the Phantom Menace, you know, titled Star Trek Lower Decks is Awful, Episode 1 Review. So they were already calling it a bad show without even giving it a chance. But the funny part is by about Episode 4, Episode 5, a good portion of the audience was basically going, you know what? Star Trek Lower Decks really isn't all that bad of a show. And you saw a lot of these Phantom Menace channels that were originally slamming Lower Decks every single week quickly abandon ship. Lar largely because their own audience was starting to turn on where it's like, hey, this show actually isn't all that bad and you're just and you're just over exaggerating how bad it is because you know you got you you got you gotta get those hate clicks in. Now, I've pretty much covered everything that needs to be covered. This is nothing more than Gamergate 2.0. You know, like I said, some of these channels will move on and survive, but a good number of the big Phantom Menace channels will die simply because most of the people that are subscribed to these channels and watch the videos are there for the controversy and not for the personalities. A couple of them did wisely build up their personalities and started creating their own things. Basically, some Phantom Menace channels did put their money where their mouth was, whereas a portion of others basically became TMZ light, you know, basically became the geeks and gamers of the world. And this is the biggest problem with building up your channel on controversy. Once the controversy dies, so does your channel. But these channels also have to deal with other things that I failed to mention before. Once Star Wars dies, they die. Once Star Trek dies, they die. Once Doctor Who dies, they die. Hence, it is no longer in the Phantom Menace's best interest for any of these franchises to course correct, simply because once that happens, there's no reason for them to exist. Also, I should have said their problem was threefold. And this is, and, and I did not think of this until just now. You know, these particular franchises, Star Wars, Star Trek, Doctor Who, they have to hope and pray to God that these franchises remain culturally, culturally relevant until Kingdom Come, because if they don't, bye-bye Phantom Menace. Boy, oh boy, did they create quite a conundrum for themselves. And I'll, I'll end this week's TMRP with this. I've never had a problem with their convictions. You like what you like and you don't like what you don't like. In fact, a lot of my opinions actually overlap, oh, actually overlap with theirs. But when your entire existence is based on Mouse Wars bad, Kurtzman Trek bad, Jodie Whittaker Doctor Who bad, then at some point, you either have to shit or get off the pot. Create your own things as a counter to all of these problems in these franchises. They don't have to be the next $100 million movies either. Write a book, draw a comic, graphic novel, do something original. Put your money where your mouth is. If you want to see the change in the entertainment industry, then be the fucking change. And this is going to do it for this week's episode of TMRP, guys. Thanks so much if you made it this far. And as always, you know I'm always really bad at signing off, so I guess I'll see you guys next time.